Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, you are good, and you are kind, and you are loving, and you are gracious. And many of us watching this, whether it's in our living rooms, or offices, or cars, bedrooms, wherever it is right now, God, um, we believe that. And many of us know that truth, that you are good, and that you're loving, and you're gracious, and you're kind, and you still have good plans, and give good gifts. And many of us believe that, and yet all of us, God, are still a little... um, uncertain about that truth. And God, there's others of us listening and watching right now who um, they're not sure that you're loving or gracious or that you're even real. And well, God, I don't feel like I can convince anyone of anything. I do believe wholeheartedly with all that I am, Jesus, that you want to make yourself known to every single person listening. Every single person watching, God, you want them to know you, to be loved by you, to live the life that you have for them and tell us in your scriptures that that life is abundant, fully alive. And so God, the conviction of the day is we believe by opening up your word that you can show us more about yourself and therefore show us more about ourselves and allow us to live the life that you have called us to live and bring this good news to those you've called us to bring it to. And so God, as we begin this new series, would, uh, would it bring certainty to our hearts and minds about uh, the joy that's found in your salvation? Would it bring certainty to our hearts and minds about your providence that you see and work in all things, that you're bending and shaping all things for our good and your glory with it? Would it do that, God? Would it bring certainty to that? Would it bring us some certainty about the fact that you're still living and active and you're going to complete the good works that you've begun and God there are some of us here who frankly God aren't sure that you're good and that you're loving or gracious or even that you exist and so God I just pray um, Lord that you would really make yourself known that you would give us uh, I don't know, a spirit of curiosity where we'd be intrigued by you and what your plans are and God would you take this time now and take your word now that you tell us never returns void and make yourself known Uh, confirm in our hearts affirm in our hearts God who you are and how much you love us and God would we would we be resolved to pursue you more to love you more to love others more as a result of this time and we pray all these things in your name Jesus amen hey really good to see you all um really excited about this brand new series is uh, what we're starting and so while back I was on sabbatical and while I was on sabbatical I really did get to take some time to go hey Lord um really want our church to be pleasing to you really want my life to be pleasing to you really uh would love for us to know how to hear from you and do what you say right like that's kind of the the big picture of how do we hear from God and do what he says and um what became evident as I just was sorting through that, definitely reading the news, watching what's going on in culture, and just realizing that uh, there's just not a lot of good models out there. Uh, a lot of people worth following, folks you can trust in. And um, in the church, you go, well, well, you trust in Jesus. You follow Jesus. And then you, what would Jesus do, right? Um, all those kind of things, which is all very true. And what just became evident is, if we're supposed to trust in Jesus, follow Jesus, ask the question, what would Jesus do? Then it would make sense that we'd really know where Jesus walked and know what he said and know his mission and his vision for our world and our lives and know what Jesus would do in that. And so I just felt really convicted that it makes sense for at least our church family for now and maybe for the, the, the greater Christian community and the greater world that it would make sense that we could really, really investigate uh, the person and work of Jesus, investigate the claims that he made, investigate his death, and investigate his resurrection. And so just felt led to spend a good deal of time, and I'm talking about a good deal of time, months, if not years, um, spending some time in the gospel of Luke 
And if you're not familiar, the Gospel of Luke is one of the four Gospels of the New Testament. So the Bible's kind of broke up two parts, Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament is 39 books that just tell one story of a great God who is mighty and powerful and yet loving and gracious, right? And that story talks about how God created humans, invited us into his plan, and to be connected in relationship with him, and then tells the story of how humans just decided they didn't want to do that. And the world got messy for that reason, and look around, the world is still messy. So if you look at the 39 books, there's this, this, this proclamation of who God is, the proclamation of all the promises and covenants that he'd make, that he, where there was no way, he would make a way, that there was nothing we could do on our own to earn favor with God, and there was nothing we could do to, to, to completely banish God from our life, that he was going to make a way where there was no way. He was always going to come through at the end of the day, right? And so the Old Testament kind of tells the story of God's might and God's grace and God's love for his children, his people. That's us. And then throughout the Old Testament, there was these sometimes whispers in the scriptures from the prophets, and sometimes these big, bold proclamations of saying, one day, one day God will take everything sad and turn it unsad. One day God will take everything dead and bring it back to life. And all that, all that was going to happen through what was called in the Old Testament the Christ or the Messiah. So 39 books continue to point to one day there would be a Christ, a Messiah. That's the Old Testament. And it would be this promise of things to come, right? And that God was going to resolve all things. And then the New Testament begins with a story of that Christ, that God himself incarnate, put on, put on flesh and blood in the, in the person of Jesus, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the, the second part of the Trinity. And Jesus would come and invade our life and our space. One of the cr craziest, most miraculous things in the world is that God put on a human body and stepped on this planet. I understand. That sounds so crazy. So crazy. And so uh, what would happen is, uh, and what would happen in the New Testament kind of started with these, these four biographies about Jesus because the whole Bible points to one hero. That's not us. That's not the, that's not the is, um, Israeli army. That's not King David. That's not Abraham or Moses or Paul or Peter. There's one hero in the entire story, and that's Jesus. And so the New Testament starts with these, these four biographies about Jesus' life. And they're written by real people. And so um, if you were to read the New Testament, it would start with a guy named Matthew. The first gospel was with a guy named Matthew, right? And Matthew literally walked with Jesus when Jesus was here. And so he captured the story of Jesus' life. And he wrote it out so that we would know that story. And then there's another story, another gospel written by uh, Mark. And Mark, uh, Mark was a guy who was in the first century, walked with Paul, saw the first uh, uh, Christian church take off and move, and saw this great movement. And again, he writes a story, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to tell us the story of who Jesus is. You know, Matthew and Mark, as they write this, they have their own unique audiences, and I'll tell you about that more throughout the series. And then another guy who wrote it was a guy named John, and John was, um, John was a, Jesus' little buddy. He actually was referred to as John the Beloved, the one whom Jesus loved. He was the youngest of the, the first 12 disciples. In fact, Jesus loved him so much and trusted him so much. When he is dying on the cross, he looks at John and says, John, will you take care of my mother? In other words, will you be her new surrogate son, right? Will you take care? And so John writes a biography about Jesus' life. And then one other, you know, these guys, they were all kind of very first century. All Jews become Christians, right? These are pretty important guys. And then one other guy is Luke. And for the next year, probably, maybe more, we're going to be looking at this guy, Luke. Real person in history. A real person who had a real story. And Luke was a Gentile. He didn't grow up with Jewish pedigree. He didn't know all the Jewish laws. He didn't know all the Jewish heroes of the faith. He didn't know about David and Abraham and Moses. He didn't know about Isaac and Jacob and Jeremiah and Isaiah and, Je you know, uh, Ezekiel. He didn't, he didn't know about all those guys. He was, a, he was a foreigner and an outsider. And we don't know a lot about Luke, but we know that Luke writes a gospel. And not only does he write the gospel uh, of Luke, he also then continues the sequel. And we've been studying it here in the book of Acts, which is, so Ru Luke basically writes about uh, two themes. 
First one is the gospel of Luke, Luke's gospel. And it's all about the person and work of Jesus. And it chronicles his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. Then he continues with the resurrection in the book of Acts, and he writes about the first century church. And so Luke, um, really, really neat guy, and we're going to be studying him for quite some time and uh, studying his book. And so it just uh, makes sense that you would uh, become acquainted with Luke. Which makes it a little hard because um, it's kind of hard to become acquainted with Luke because I just told you Luke wrote a book about um, Jesus and then he wrote a book about the church. He actually didn't write a book about himself. And so we don't have a lot of information. No, we know the gospel according to Luke. We understand how he wrote it, why he wrote it, all those kind of things. And so we'll work through that. But the thing I'll tell you about Luke, we can find it in a biography about his life. Um, maybe... 200 years after he dies, talking about the gospel of Luke, and this is what it says about him, really, really neat. It says this. Indeed, Luke was an Antiochian Syrian. So that means an outsider. He was uh, a Gentile. That means non— he was pagan. He had no Jewish roots, had no familiarity with Jewish customs. He was just an outsider, like us, right? Many of us. A doctor by profession, a disciple of the apostles— Later, however, he followed Paul until his martyrdom. No, this is an 1,800-year-old document that tells us this. He followed Paul until his martyrdom. That's Paul, the guy who writes two-thirds of the book of the New Testament. No, he doesn't. Uh, Paul doesn't write two-thirds of the content. Two-thirds of the content is written by Luke. So two-thirds of the content, Luke, and the book of Luke, and the, the book of uh, Acts. And then Paul writes many letters, all sorts of stuff. And so Paul, first-century missionary, it says he was a— he was, um, he later, however, he followed Paul into his martyrdom, serving the Lord blamelessly. So while this isn't an exposition on Luke, it does make sense that we understand Luke's life and learn from Luke's life. And just really such a beautiful statement. If you're interested in having that descriptor, I would love it. Serving the Lord blamelessly. Now watch this. He never had a wife. Never had a wife. Never fathered children. And died at the age of 84. Never had a wife. Never had children, and it's like, well, I mean, this was a sacrifice he made. I mean, he's a doctor. You know, he could have been walking into any place and going, hey, have you ever heard of that book, the Bible? Yep, wrote two-thirds of it. Oh, by the way, I'm a doctor, right? I mean, like, the ladies would have been interested in him. And, I, I mean, I can't imagine. I can't imagine not having my wife. I can't imagine not having my children. Like, such a great gift, such a great honor. And yet, Luke— doesn't ever have those things. He's a doctor, never has a wife, never has children, and it died at the age of 84. That's really, really beautiful. That's more than twice the life expectancy at that time. And it says this, full of the Holy Spirit in Boatia, right? So one of the neat things about the Gospel of Luke that you'll, you'll become acquainted with is um, some scholars refer to it as the Gospel of the Holy Spirit, which is really great because we've been studying the Holy Spirit for quite some time, and um, uh, that Luke really, really writes about the work of the Holy Spirit, both in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts. And so that's Luke. So what's really neat about Luke is Luke was a physician turned investigative journalist, right? And so um, what that means is Luke was a doctor, and you're going to see another guy that's going to show up, and we'll talk a little bit more about him in a little while. His name is Theophilus. Theophilus is this benefactor, this guy who literally funds a fellowship for Luke to go and study the person and work of Jesus, to go investigate, and you'll see how he investigated in just a second, and, and write this story for us to, to receive and understand who Jesus was. I'm so moved by it. By the time he gets in the book of Acts, he, he starts writing words like, we went— we were there, right? And Paul actually says in uh, 2 Timothy, in the middle of all of his, like, uh, persecution and suffering, he talks about how everybody else abandoned him, like every single person abandoned him. And he says this, except for Luke. Everyone abandoned except for Luke. So we see Luke insert himself in the story. So Luke is this doctor, right? I mean, I don't know, I don't know um, many medical doctors, that, but I know some. And what I know is it takes a lot of school and a lot of education and a lot of time and a lot of money. And 
Uh, most people look forward to their physicians to, uh, when they get past that, I don't know, 10, 15 year mark of being in the medical profession when the student loans are paid for, all that kind of stuff, and can kind of start enjoying the fruits of the, their labor. This would have been about the time that Luke is. I mean, he would have been able to enjoy the profession. He would have had experience and study and all those kind of things. So he could have participated in bringing healing to people in the medical profession, but also making a good living wage. And what we understand about Luke is instead he goes on this uh, multi-year journey to study who Jesus is, right? And this is really, really important that you understand this, and this is why I want to start with Luke before we get to the first four verses. That's all we're going to read today in uh, Luke chapter 1. I want you to understand Luke because when you understand Luke, you also understand the, the stigma that comes to the church, with the church right now is, is such a falsehood, right? You got like, we don't believe in that stuff because we believe in science, right? And so the, the wave the flag of science, like somehow we can't believe in Jesus or God because we believe in science, right? Wave the flag. And so this, uh, over the last, I don't know, couple decades, 40, 50 years, there's kind of been this idea that uh, you, science uh, negates God, cancels out God, and if you believe in God, therefore you're not educated. And I just would say that's just one of the, the greatest writers that we have in human history. I mean, I don't, I don't know many of the people who people are still reading their works 2,000 years later, right? I mean, if you're a writer and someone is referencing your work 10 years later, you are well esteemed, right? And so 2,000 years later, we are still reading this scientist, this doctor's works. And so this isn't like Luke just suspends all reality to believe in this God. He is a scientist and journalist and investigative reporter who's going to go and and, and invade every area of Jesus's life and his culture to, to, to uh, put together a compilation of Jesus's narrative in, in kind of a, in a, in a uh, orderly fashion, right? And so that's one of the things I think is really neat is um, just to follow Jesus doesn't mean you need to stop going to school or uh, no, you can't be a doctor or engineer or lawyer or whatever it is that you have these longings to be. Like somehow those professions and that education is somehow uh, anti the gospel. And in many ways, that's what I love about our church, you know, with so many chemical engineers in the mix and medical professionals. What you see is there are people who are well-educated, actually brilliant minds, who have been able to reconcile the, the brilliance of science with the brilliance of God being the one who created the science. And so what I love about science personally is I don't think it actually uh, discounts God. I think it actually just helps us define what God has done for us. And so Luke is going to do that for us. He's a scientist. Hear me here. He's a scientist who likes clarity and certainty, right? And so right now, what's really neat is since you're watching this online, um, you can pause it whenever you want. And I just would say, now might be a really good time to pause it and uh, send a message, text message, uh, share a post on Facebook to, to your friends who are kind of like, ah, I don't believe in that Bible stuff because science or whatever. Why don't you invite them in this? Look, at my goal is not to try to manipulate or even persuade, but I do think it's really important that we understand that the guy who wrote the, the book of Luke was a scientist. In fact, he actually captures four different uh, miracles that aren't found in any other gospel. And they're all like miracles that Jesus does with individuals, right? Someone with um, uh, a skin disorder, uh, 10 lepers who are coming into church, right? Some, uh, someone who has all sorts of other issues. So he's, he's actually investigating these miracles from a scientist's perspective, from a doctor's perspective. So this is a guy who's, who's turning over the rocks and stones, and he comes to a conclusion that not only should he write the book, he should insert himself in the book in the movement of the gospel. And he was full of the Holy Spirit, died at the age of 84, with no wife, no children, but boy, does he have a legacy. And so Luke writes a book. Uh, the first book he writes is the Gospel of Luke. And here's why I like it and why we've chosen it over Matthew, Mark, or John. Love those Gospels as well. But this is the longest of the Gospels. There's 1,151 verses in, in the Gospel of Luke. Now, it's not, uh, it's not a hefty read. You could, if you, like an average reader, probably if you start at the beginning, could read it in uh, two hours, right? And so um, maybe you want to over the next couple months each week. Just read, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day in the Gospel of Luke. And 
uh, you'll read it once a week for the next, you know, several weeks as you kind of get used to it. But the thing I like about this is the 1,151 verses in, in the book. Now hear this. 568 of those verses are direct quotation of Jesus' words. Here, see that? Over half of them, or nearly half of the, the, the verses are literally quotations. This is the type of journalist you want, right? One who cites its sources. So Luke cites his sources 568 times with Jesus. So he literally quotes Jesus. So if you really want to know what, what would Jesus do, let's understand what Jesus said and Jesus did. And Luke is a really beautiful opportunity for us to do that. So uh, 568 of those 1,151 uh, verses are are direct quotations of Jesus. We believe that Luke wrote this in somewhere between 62, 63, 64 AD, and he kind of wrote the Gospel of Luke and then the book of Acts kind of one year after the other. So this would have been 30 or so years after Jesus dies, and we, uh, scholars would tell you that most of the time was spent actually spending time interviewing, investigating, all those kind of things. We'll get to that a little bit later in this passage. And so that's where we find it. So Luke is a physician who walks away from the medical field uh, for a while to go and uh, study Jesus, to study his life. What's also really neat is while he, he maybe leaves his private practice, he, he's walking with Paul. He's making recommendations about medical stuff. You can read it in Colossians, other places, some of these stuff. That, uh, so he is a doctor, and he's with Paul on the, medic, you know, on, the, on the mission field. Really, really, really neat to see. And so that is Luke. Luke, the doctor. Full of the Holy Spirit, scientist, uh, research, fellowship, man, and that is Luke. And then the next guy you got to understand is Theophilus. Uh, Theophilus is um, what we believe to be a government official. The reason being is when Paul kind of, I mean, I'm sorry, when Luke uh, writes to him, writes about him, he says the most excellent Theophilus. And uh, that's a state title. It's kind of reserved in the book of Acts. You see it several times where it's talking about a government official. So we believe Theophilus, like Luke, um, is a Gentile, doesn't have a, a Jewish name. So he had been a Gentile, you know, in the you know, in, the, in a government capacity. Obviously, if he's paying Luke to do this, um, he has uh, some affluence to him. So a wealthy government official. Um, so we got Theophilus, and we don't really know exactly why he decides to pay Luke to write this grant. We have some assumptions, and here would be my assumption in this as, as I studied this. It sure seems like the ramifications of believing in Jesus as Lord are pretty hefty. Right? I mean, like, so he would be walking away from other things he believed, other parts of his culture, other uh, um, relationships uh, he would have participated in, right? This, this now, in this uh, day and age, you didn't say Jesus is Lord, you said Caesar is Lord. And so if this is a government official that has hefty ramifications for it, and so it makes sense that he would want some real certainty about where he's placing his hope and trust. Same as us, right? Like, there are some real ramifications for how our lives are led, how we spend our money, how we participate in activities and care for our neighbors based on whether or not this gospel's true, right? If this is true, then it really could change so much of our, our daily lives. And so I'm, uh, the belief is Theophilus is probably wanting to make sure that, it, that, that while he believes this, he's heard it, considers it, there is some skepticism in him and he wants to kind of investigate so he's going to find the best private eye there is and going to send Magnum Luke PI right at, out into the world to, to investigate all this stuff so he has some affluence to him he probably has some responsibilities and he doesn't have you know the skills to do what Luke's going to do so he's going to send his uh, the, the guy that he believes has the best capability of seeking and understanding and presenting truth to uh, to him and so what what Theophilus is going to do is he's going to send Luke to go chase after truth. Now here's the last thing I'll say about this and then we'll start reading. It'll be definitely worth your time to stay with us. Is here's what I believe wholeheartedly, right? And I told you this two weeks ago that truth is not some kind of idea or something that's created. You don't get your own truth. You don't live your own truth, right? At, at its base value, truth is a person. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, meaning truth is a person, right? And so what I believe wholeheartedly is as you search for truth, right? As you chase after truth, what eventually you'll end up with is Jesus, right? And someone said it. I can't 
I can't attribute the quote because I don't know who it was. I've looked everywhere for it. If you happen to find it, I'd love for you to share it with me. I cannot find it anywhere, but I'm pretty confident I didn't make it up. It's this, that theology is the crown jewel of all academics, meaning when you chase down any kind of academic field to its base level, that's history, that's science, that's math, that's music, that's art, right? And you get to its basic level, and as far as you possibly can, when you search for its origin, what you find at the very beginning of that, that spoke of that will, right, is, or that hub of those spokes of the will, right, is that in that place is where you'll find Jesus, where you'll find theology, right? Why, why is there only seven notes on the scale, seven colors, and, you know, the, the rainbow? Why, why is there only seven days in a week? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things to, to consider there. Why are there so many dimensions in mathematics, but we can't even see them? Well, where do those come from? Why do we even have numbers like infinity? What does that point to, right? And so all these different things that we kind of kind of sort through. And so uh, Theophilus is a guy who's really, really going to search for truth, and he's going to invest the money necessary for him to find the absolute truth. That's what he's going after here. So he's going he's to invest in Luke to find the truth, and then Luke is going to present his findings, and that's what we're going to get to read. And so that is the gospel of Luke. So here goes. Luke is going to begin this gospel. What's really neat is if you look at the other gospels, they're kind of written to a people group. Like there's all sorts of different ones for different groups. Like Matthew wrote to a certain group, uh, Jewish background. Mark wrote to a certain group. Those would have been Romans. That John wrote to a certain group. That would have been uh, Greeks. Luke is a Gentile, probably writing from a Gentile perspective. And so um, when you look at the different gospels, they're actually written to a certain people group. What's so amazing about this is Luke's initial plan in this is just to write to a person. So, so amazing about God is God is so big, so loving, so caring for all people, and yet he also is so focused on the one. And so Luke is going to present these findings to Theophilus and God, and the Holy Spirit are going to use them as this ancient document to help us really understand who Jesus is. And this is what I want you to understand more than anything else. This was so neat about the Bible. These are real people. Luke was a real person. He has a tomb where his body lays right now in Ephesus, Turkey, right? Like, I mean, he was a real person. These are, these are not some make-believe folklore legend. I mean, he was, a, he, he was a real, genuine human being who did this investigation, who would have had the same skepticism and cynicism that you and I have. And he would have presented his findings as a real human being that God then captures and puts in, has put in his scripture so that 2,000 years later, we can read them. So that's how I want you to read this gospel of Luke. And because I want us to be really, really intentional with every word Luke writes, we're going to go real slow through this, and we're going to kind of clump it into small parts. In fact, the, the next six weeks, including this one and five more, we will only get, to Luke, through, get through Luke chapter 1. So slow, methodical. I want you to want to read this and make sure we cover it well and don't feel rushed. And so here's Luke's writing. He writes the letter. This is a real, genuine document written by a real person captured in human history for us today. And here's what it says. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, Okay, a lot going on here. One other thing I'll point out is I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, there's, you know, there's lots of different translations. Uh, some are word for word. Some are thought for thought. Some are um, idea for idea kind of thing. And so you go from paraphrase to literal. And um, English Standard I spends most of the time where I typically teach from NIV uh, for the next, while we work through the series, I really want to go uh, with the ESV because it's a, it's a literal word for word translation. So it's taking the Greek. It's imagining uh, what the Greek or the Aramaic when Jesus is quoting other things in the book of Luke, what that word is meant to intend and then translating that word, right? And so um, one of the things that we know about Luke, other than that he was a scientist, uh, scholars would say his Greek and his grammar were impeccable. So this is a very educated man, right? And so because his Greek and grammar were impeccable, it makes sense that we would try to really pay attention to the words that he's trying to use and uh, the language he's trying to present in front of us. So anyway, and so it's going to start hefty. And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that I have accomplished among us, uh, been, uh, been accomplished among us. So what Luke is saying is, hey, look, I'm not the first to write this, right? By this point, Matthew and Mark, those gospels have already been written 
probably canonized to the local uh, congregations. They're going, these are Jesus' words, right? People are trying to capture these. Jesus has now died. He's been resurrected. The, the church is starting moving forward. All sorts of beautiful things. Holy Spirit is having its way. And thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are coming to faith in Jesus. And they're going, we need them to know who Jesus is. Like, we need them to know everything about Jesus. We need them to hear Jesus' words. We need to get his teaching. And so Matthew and Mark both uh, present, write some gospels. At this point, by the time Luke writes this, um, uh, Paul has already written several of his letters to the local Christian congregations, right? And so when Luke is saying this, look, it's as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative. There's already been a lot of people who have captured lots of narratives, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and so all these different narratives, uh, John. And so when Luke is, what he's going to do is he's going to, what he's saying is, I'm going to take all this stuff and start to understand it and make sure that we can understand what's been accomplished among us and what Jesus has done, right? And so what what was going to happen, if you're not familiar with the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called uh, the synoptic Gospels. They're synopsis, uh, so they're summaries, and they have a lot in common, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are about 60% of the same stories in all of them, right? And so uh, these are similar stories. John is kind of its own unique bird. Really, really like it. Um, really neat way to write. A little bit more concise where Luke is a lot more methodical. Really, really long. And so those all three. And so what, what, what's happening here is Louis going, look, I have actually gone and looked at the other stories that are written. And this is what you don't need to understand if you're wondering about Luke and how he's going to go about studying Jesus. And we're going to study Jesus through Luke over the next, you know, year, two years, whatever that is. Is the first thing he does is he compiles all the written narratives, right? So he goes and he gets all the written documents. So he's going, and as much as, it, as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So he's taken all this stuff, right? Like, so he's, he's compiling all the data. So he's got Matthew, he's got Mark, he's got Paul's letter. So he's bringing all those in. So he's got all that stuff. So he's saying, the first thing that's happened, he's going, hey, Theophilus, I've, I've gathered all the data. I've gathered gathered all the written words that have been made about Jesus. So that's the first thing he does. Now, this isn't a copy of a copy. He's not just going to take those words and just write those. You'll see that in just a second, but he's going, hey, and as much has been written, I've gone after all I can. I've gone to libraries. I've gone place to place. I've gathered all the written words, right? So they tell the story of Jesus, really, really neat. And so he's gathered all those words. And then he goes to verse two, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So he's going to go, okay. First, the office. Remember, this is a letter telling Theophilus how he compiled this, right? Like, so he's going, he's about to present his findings, right? So he's going to tell him how he went about finding his findings. You've got to see this. This is, this is beautiful. This isn't just some ancient book that we're supposed to read and memorize and tell people about. Like, it's, it's a literal human being who went and studied and did all the work that we couldn't do because we're, we're 2,000 years later. So he says, hey, first, I went and I compiled all the data, all the written words out there. I went and got those. Really, really amazing. And then he said, just as those from the beginning where I witnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So let me, let me hit the second part of this verse first. See that thing where it says ministers of the word had delivered them to us? You with me there? You got it right there behind me? So this is be really important. Only five to ten percent of men, okay, and men were considered, uh, were the most educated at the time. Only five to ten percent of, of men were literate. Only five to ten percent could read or write. Uh, Greek, Hebrew, whatever, whatever it was, right? Only five to ten percent of men, meaning the majority of, of the, the people were illiterate. And so the way that happened within the church was through oral tradition. So in each town, in each synagogue, in each, you know, community, and now in each of these Christian churches, as they're learning and trying to discover, figure out how to read, all those kind of things, well, what happened is one individual couple individuals, the kind of the, the ministers. You see that? Ministers of the word have delivered them to us. That those ministers were responsible for kind of the curation and the delivery of the good news, right? And they're responsible for the, the curation and delivery of all the Old Testament and all the story of God. That's why I talk to you so much about creation, fall, redemption, restoration. They were the ones who were making sure that, that the whole story is there and that it was straight and clear and accurate. So there was kind of a person who was responsible for that, right? And you see it, and we have them in our church, like the, the people who just know the history of our congregation or know the history of the community or know the history of, you know, the nation, whatever it is. You know, there's just, there's just people like that. And so um, what Lucas 
Luca saying here that I was going, hey, not only did I compile all the data of all the words, I also went and I listened to and heard from all these oral traditions, all these things for the last 30 years that people were talking about when they saw Jesus, how they experienced Jesus, what it was like to see the scars on his hands, what it was like when he went into the tomb, what it was like when the tomb was empty, what it was like when the angel showed up to the shepherds. Like I, I went and I heard the stories and, and met with these ministers of the word that had delivered it to the people, right? So first was uh, written documents, one way. Second one was oral tradition. And then you see the third one there right at the beginning. It says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. So what we know from this is Luke was not an eyewitness of Jesus. He um, wasn't a Jew, wasn't in the first club, right? And so he would not have witnessed Jesus, probably didn't witness his death, probably didn't witness his trial, probably didn't witness his resurrection. So sometime in faith, maybe even like, maybe, who knows, maybe he's connected to Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10 and 11. We don't know. Luke doesn't write about himself very much at all. But what we do know is that Luke wasn't an eyewitness, but what he actually did here was he went and he got eyewitness accounts. So while we believe this was written 62, 63, 64 AD, so within about 30 years of Jesus' death and resurrection, it also tells us at, in verse 4 that it, it took some time for him to compile all this. So I don't know, years, decades. And so what, what scholars will tell you, and, and, and I think makes perfect sense, Luke, the investigative journalist, the scientist, the doctor, you know, the seeker of truth and clarity, the private eye, <laughs> would have gone and sat down. So it's a real possibility that he would have gone and sat with the shepherds and asked them about it. He would have gone and made time to sit with Mary, the mother of God, and go, well, tell me about what that was like when, when the angel showed up. He would have gone and chatted with Peter. We know he gets a lot of information there. Like he would have chatted with Peter about, hey, what was it like when you cut that guy's ear off? right? Like when Jesus walked on water, well, no, no, really, what were your first thoughts? When you started saying, no, 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 really, what was the first thing you said? No, come on, Peter. That's not, you know, that, like he would have, he would have engaged with them, real humans on this planet living. They had walked with Jesus, and now they're going to share the stories, and Luke is going to go get eyewitness accounts. He's going to go ask everybody he can about Jesus. So he is compiling a, a ton of data. So he's going, hey, and as much as people have already written this, uh, we, I've captured those documents. And uh, just as those in the beginning were eyewitnesses, I've captured that information. And ministers, I've captured the oral traditions of the word have delivered to us. And so watch what he says in verse 3. It seemed, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely, for some time past. See that? It seemed good to me also. It seemed like I should do something. Having followed all things closely for some time past. So I've been, this has been my life's work. No marriage, no kids, just Jesus, right? I'm just investigating Jesus. I'm just investigating Jesus. I'm trying to figure out if this is true because I'm not going to stake my life. We know he, he dies in martyrdom with Paul, right? So uh, he, in Jesus, I want to know if I should stake my life on him. Does it make sense to follow him with my whole heart, right? Is that what I should do? And so he said, for all my time, I have followed all things closely for some time past. And this is what it makes it seem to him. To write an orderly account for you. So Luke says to Theophilus, I decided to write an orderly account for you, Theophilus. For you, Theophilus. So he's now presenting his findings. He's going, look, yeah, yeah, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And Matthew, Mark, those are some good writings. I like the writings. But it just seemed like there's some things that I could write specifically for you. Based on my experiences, based on what I got from the eyewitness accounts, based on what I've heard about Jesus' teaching, right? There's some things that I can capture. This is why he gets 1,151 verses. That's a lot. Why he gets 568 quotations of Jesus' words, right? That many verses of it. Why? Because he's done all the work. He's going, hey, as I, as I see this, there it seems like I could provide some more color and some more commentary, right? Particularly for those of us who are Gentiles who didn't grow up with Jewish upbringing, Jewish understanding, like, the, like all of us, right? It just seemed like for Theophilus, you and I, it just seemed like there's a lot more stuff that I could offer, so I'm going to offer. You hear this, right? This is a real human being going, let me share with you everything I've discovered about Jesus. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, ordained by God, Luke is going to write this, and he's going to write it in an orderly account, which is so neat. In fact, if, uh, while Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels, this is the only gospel that is um, in chronological order, right? So you engineers out there, this is why I love that we're going to work through this. I think you'll love it too. Is those of you who like things in a 
perfect order and all your ducks in the right rows. I don't understand that. I like ducks. I don't like them in the rows. But, you know, like all that kind of stuff, right? In a chronological account, Luke's going to put it in there. Now, the other thing about Luke, and you'll get, I won't get it today, but we'll get to go through this for, um, you know, like I said, next year, maybe a couple years, is that Luke gives us probably the most depth and breadth in Jesus' teaching. You know, for many of you who really like the artsy part of Jesus' teaching, particularly the parables, Luke is the one that captures the most, right? And so a lot of Jesus' teaching, he's on go when he's going to get from eyewitness accounts that were there sitting there and going, Jesus said the craziest thing. Let me tell you about this. He pulled out this coin and started talking about it. And so Luke is going to capture all those parables and we're going to work through them and understand what Jesus was saying from an eyewitness account that shared that with Luke. For example, um, many of you love the story of the prodigal son. If you don't know it, we'll get to it. Luke 15, right? That only comes um, in the, the Gospel of Luke. Oh, many of you, your favorite is uh, the Good Samaritan. Guess what? Also only found in the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the two debtors, the parable of the friend at midnight, the parable of the rich fool, the parable of punishment, the parable of the barren tree, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the shrewd, parable of the shrewd manager, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the parable of the persistent widow, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, all found in Luke, right? So Luke's going, hey, there's some stuff that I could bring to, to the table for you, to Theophilus, so you can know this, right? There's some stuff that's going to be available that's going to blow your mind and ma- transform you in the way that you see and understand and follow Jesus, right? So he's going to say, hey, there's lots of those kind of things. By the way, uh, the other thing I like about Luke is he gives us probably, uh, in fact, the only real account of Jesus' life after, I mean, we all get the baby account, but anything having to do with Jesus as a, you know, as an adolescent, only found the gospel of Luke. So, hey, if you're a kid or teenager, you're really neat. You're going to see some of that in Jesus. Um, many of us, and I, and I, I think rightfully so, have a, a deep longing to see equality uh, for people, whether uh, women particularly, a lot of us are, are that. And many of you in that category really love Mary and Martha. Well, yep, they make their cameo here in the Gospel of Luke. Mary and Martha, they show up here. Um, many of us have battles and struggles with injustice and wondering why there's poor and poverty. Luke addresses that. He captures the time that Jesus talks about poverty. Many of you are short and only in the Gospel of Luke is the story of Zacchaeus covered, and so you get that as well, right? And so, another neat thing I told you is Luke captures four miracles that aren't captured in any other of the Gospels. One of a crippled woman, one of a dema, one, uh, one with ten lepers, and, and, and. Remember when Peter cuts the guy's ear off? Only Luke captures it, right? The doctor wants to know how the ear gets put back on so fast, right? And so only Luke, only Luke, this doctor, this investigative, private investigator, journalist, right? He is the only one that captures all these things. And so if you, um, what I'm hoping happens is you're going to get excited about keep coming back and learning about Jesus through this guy who did some real, real deep level thesis, dissertation level study and data collection all here. Gospel of Luke. And then, the other thing I'd say, and this is kind of secondary, but I think uh, scholars will point this out, so I'm going to point it out to you as well, is uh, the the name Theophilus literally means, uh, in the Greek, uh, lover of God. Theo, right? Theophilus, lover of God. And so, uh, many would say, well, um, Luke's primary audience was Theophilus. Kind of the belief is a secondary audience was anybody who um, loves God. So let me put you in the category of maybe you don't believe in Jesus yet, but uh, Theophilus may have been wrestling with this thing about Jesus. Hey, I believe in God, but I don't know about Jesus. Would you go investigate him? Like if you're just a lover of creation, right? You're a lover of the outdoors. You're a lover of camping, right? You're a lover of those things. I just go, you're not too far from just being a lover of God because he's the one who created all that stuff, right? If you're a lover of all things good, if you're a lover of love, if you're a lover of, you know, uh, uh, good foods, right? If you're a lover of cooking, right? You're not that far away from, because God is the author of all that stuff, from being a lover of God. And so there's something neat about Luke writing to this lover of God going, hey, hey, maybe, maybe for all of us, if we're lovers of God or lovers of the things of God, we're not too from all, far off like the office of becoming a lover of Jesus, right? And so not going to resolve any of that today, but what we will resolve is this idea of who Jesus is, that Luke investigates on our behalf. God sends him, ordains him, not just for Theophilus, but for you and me. And so we're going to take our time to really, really digest this stuff. And then finally, Luke gives us the thesis of the entire gospel of Luke. You ready for this? Verse four, last one we'll read, and it says this. 
that you may have certainty. That you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. So the other reason I was so drawn to this passage, or this, this gospel, is this. As I think about um, just the complications of the world and what's been going on in it. And I would just say... Um, Boy, if there's something we're craving that we don't know, I mean, some of you are there right now just wondering what your kids are going to do for school in the fall, right? Or whether or not your job's coming back, or some of you are wondering when we're going to be able to meet back in person. And one of the things that we're all kind of longing for and that's kind of been pulled away from us foundationally is just certainty. Just certainty, right? When you just like to have some kind of certainty about it, and it's something, like just some certainty. Just know what the next step is, just something certain. And it just sure seems like certainty's disappeared. And some of that is because in many ways certainty is an illusion right you can't control things you we think we control but control is such an illusion that just and just not something that we actually know right we don't know that we're going to be here tomorrow not fear-mongering right we don't know what the next diagnosis is going to be at the doctor we don't know what our kids are going to do today right you got all these things that we're not really in control and we're not nothing's really certain anyway but we long for certainty and we're going, where do we find certainty? And I can imagine Theophilus going, look, I need to know if this is true because I, can, I'm, I have to say Caesar is Lord. But if Jesus is Lord, then I need to say Jesus is Lord. But that has some ramifications for in this world. But I'm not as concerned about this world as I am the next world if the next world really is certain. Right? And so all of us are longing for some certainty. And what I love about the Gospel of Luke and what we get to do together, while everything else in this world might be uncertain, we might not have any plans that we can completely write and in blue ink anymore. But is there something we could find that could, we could just be certain of? And what Luke is saying to Theophilus and to us, he's saying, I'm going to present the evidence to you. And there's a reason I'm going to present the evidence to you. This is like the opening argument in a trial. I'm going to, what you're going to see is I'm going to lay out all the facts. And you're going to get all the facts, all the facts. I'm going to give you all the data, all the written documents, all the oral traditions, all the eyewitness accounts. We're going to bring them up one by one. Right, right. I'm going to do all these things. So you've got to see this as an opening argument. And the reason I'm going to do all this is because, 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 at, at the end, when we get to the end, here's what's going to happen. You are going to be able to have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. Certainty. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now, I understand why it seems uncertain, because it is the craziest story in the world. In fact, in fact, in fact, the idea that God himself would end up on a Roman cross, brutally beaten, stripped naked and murdered on a cross and while doing that while being spat on and you know gamble with his clothes and have dirty uh, sponges stuck to his lips all those things while he's doing all that he's making some proclamations the first one is father forgive them they don't know what they're doing the god of the universe is allowing people to treat him that way no royalty would ever allow people to treat him that way father forgive them they know what they're doing then he says something else he makes this big, bold proclamation that it's finished, that it's paid in full, meaning he's done everything that needs so that we can be certain of being able to be with him and know him and experience him now and forever. And so Luke's going, hey, 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 I know this is nuts. This is crazy. This is a crazy story. In fact, in fact, it's a reckless story that God would put on a body and step onto this planet, that he'd walk with us, that he'd look us in the eyes and tell us that we love tell us that it's the enemy who's come to steal, kill, and destroy, but he says that I've come to give you life and a full life. And he came and he lived the life we should have lived because we couldn't live it. And then he died the death we should have died. That just seems reckless. The God of the universe would do that. Couldn't he get taken advantage of? He does all the work before we ever make any commitment. That is not good negotiating skills. So Luke is going, look, the office, I understand it. It goes against everything we have in our government orders and how we do things. The God of the universe has just flipped everything upside down and he did all the work and we get all the benefits. It, understand why it's hard to believe this, but it's true. And so I'm going to present the evidence to you. At the end of it, when you get there, you're going to be so certain of the things you've been taught. So I would just want to invite you into that. Invite you into that story. Let's just go through it. So that you too can find certainty in the things that we've been taught. Because there's very few things we can be certain of. But the one thing we can be certain of is Jesus. And so what's going to happen now is we're going to close this service. And it just made sense to me that we would sing of the craziness of this story and wrestle with the craziness of who God is and what he's done for us. Wrestle with the crazy story that Luke's going to present to us for the next several months, if not years. And Luke's going to present to us of this God who is so in love 
God so loved his children, right? God was so in love with them. There was nothing he would not do. He, in what seems to be reckless, sends his son Jesus to step on this planet and to make a way for us where there is no way, to invite us back to him, to pay the price for us, to be welcomed back as sons and daughters of God. And so the band's going to lead us in this song that talks about that reckless love. And would you join me now?
Hey, thanks for leaning in, hanging out with us. Really glad you're here. Need you to come back next week. Lots of material to cover. It's going to be a lot of fun. I promise, I promise, I promise. And you can join us right here the same way online, or you can see us in person uh, next Sunday. We'd love for you to do that. But grab your Bible this week, open it up, start reading in Luke chapter 1. Take about 15 minutes a day, and then at the end of the week, you'll read through the whole Gospel of Luke and be prepared for everything we're going to learn. Can't wait to do it with you guys. Love you guys, and we'll see you soon.